It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm still here. I thought maybe you maybe talked to uh, Patrick Brown and knew something I didn't know this morning. But questions uh, for the uh, Premier. Speaker, the uh, day after this government introduced back-to-work legislation for members of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers' Federation, the Elementary Teachers' Federation of Ontario has now announced it's ramping up its Work to Rule campaign. Elementary teachers will not write transition reports or participate in transition meetings for grade 8 students. They will not plan future field trips. They will not participate in professional development. This is just the next step before a full-blown strike. Premier, will you guarantee the parents of elementary school students that they won't see a province-wide or province-wide strike in September in their sector? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the member opposite is making a huge leap. Uh, the fact is that there is a collective bargaining process that is underway, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we need to let that unfold. I know that the Minister of Education will want to comment, but, Mr. Speaker, I believe in the collective bargaining process. I mean, that's a fundamental difference between us and, uh, and the, the party opposite. We actually believe that it's important to have a process in place. It's important to follow that process, Mr. Speaker. And, and there will be times when it works better than others, Mr. Speaker. I acknowledge that, but that does not negate the importance of having a process that is respectful, in which everyone has a role, Mr. Speaker, and everyone understands what that role is. And that's what's in place in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and back to the Premier. Uh, this government uh, has failed in negotiations with Durham, it's failed in negotiations with Rainbow and Sudbury, and failed in negotiations with Peel. The Premier and the Education Minister couldn't keep students in the classroom, all because of a pathetic, cumbersome Bill 122 barring any system. Premier, these boards are just three of the 72 boards we have in Ontario. Parents and students could see this chaos and disruption spread one board at a time across the province because of this Liberal government's dysfunctional bargaining process. Our young leader, Patrick Brown, and the PC caucus know that Bill 103 is simply a Band-Aid solution. Premier, Premier, help the Order. Start the clock. Finish, please. Is that afraid of him? You're afraid of that. Well, he will be sitting right over there in 2018. How many more back to work bills will you have to introduce over the coming months? Well, Mr. Speaker. Let me, just speak, let me just speak to the process, because I said that it's important to have a process in place that everyone understands. Now, the fact is that we worked uh, with our partners, with the uh, Feder Teachers' Federations, uh, with the unions, Mr. Speaker, so teachers, support staff, we worked with boards to put in place a process that reflects the reality, Mr. Speaker, that the provincial government is the funder of publicly funded education in Ontario, and there are issues that have to be resolved at a provincial table. It also reflects the reality that there are local issues that need to be bargained locally. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, a number of years ago, when I was Minister of Education, there was an informal process that kind of reflected that reality that actually was a result of funding changes that had made, been made by the previous government. Those funding changes are in place. The province funds education. So that Answer. means we have to have a collective bargaining process that reflects that reality. That's what is in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Premier, this is very, it's a cumbersome mess you have in your hands. The three boards on strike this school year are just the beginning. Your government's mismanagement and flawed two-tier system have created education chaos for parents and students. You have desert and dragged along the negotiations, meanwhile the, using the students as pawn. Deputy Premier, uh, Premier Bill 122 is definitely the problem. The boards have said, have said so. The teachers have said so. The Education Review Commission said as much in yesterday's letter as well. Don't just bring in back-to-work legislation. Bring in a fix to your flawed bargaining process so we don't see this disaster happen again and again and again across this province. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you.
Mr. Mr. As I said, the, the process that is in place reflects the reality that the province is the funder of the education system and that uh, there are local issues, nonetheless, that need to, be, uh, need to be addressed at the local level. But there is a provincial discussion that has to happen. Mr. Speaker, you know, we have built into this process a review, so when we go through this uh, round of bargaining, if there are changes that need to be made to the process, we will look at that, Mr. Speaker. But the fact is that there has to be a process that reflects the reality. I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, that there shouldn't be a discussion at the local level because I believe in school boards. I think it's important to have school boards working with their employees, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, I don't believe that school boards should have to take the full responsibility for negotiating the financial issues that the province is actually responsible for. So if the members opposite had a suggestion that was constructive, Mr. Speaker, we'd be happy to listen to that once this round is through, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Majesty's Royal Opposition. Uh, again, to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the current Minister of Energy has held the hydro file for just over two years now. In that short amount of time, he has succeeded in having the Auditor General tell him that the government wasted $1.1 billion on the gas plant relocations, another $2 billion on smart meters, and now the Ombudsman has revealed that because of the Minister's lack of action, he has spent another $88.3 million of taxpayers' money in an attempt to correct poor billing practices at Hydro One. Added together, this almost $4 billion in wasted money is only a few million shy of what this government is claiming it will net from the sale of Hydro One. So my question to the Premier is, Premier, don't you think it's question? irresponsible to sell Hydro One just to make up for the mistakes of your incompetent minister? Thank you. I uh, will not accept interjections when I'm standing. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the question is precipitated by the Ombudsman's uh, report yesterday. Mr. Speaker, we have indicated that as a result of the new IT billing system, an unacceptable number of uh, Hydro One customers. Uh, over an extended period of time, received an unacceptable level of service. The CEO of Hydro One and the government have apologized uh, for the for the impact, Mr. Speaker. And while we know that Hydro One has been working Order. hard to resolve outstanding issues, and Hydro One has outlined that work in detail, further work and remediation is clearly required. Mr. Speaker, I therefore ask the chair of Hydro One, David Dennison, to report back to me within 40 day days with a detailed action plan describing how Hydro One can further address the recommendations Answer. in the Ombudsman's report. Mr. Speaker, I'll provide more details in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Thank you very member much. Member from Nepean Carleton will come to order. Premier, not only did Hydro One waste millions of dollars, but their incompetent and callous actions have led to countless headaches and, quite frankly, unnecessary anxiety for ratepayers across this province. Ordinary residents had money incorrectly taken from their bank accounts, while businesses were being overcharged millions of dollars. Deputy House Leader. Yet, with all of that systemic waste and lost money in the energy filed, you're telling Ontarians that Hydro One no longer needs the oversight of the officers of this legislature. You pushing through your budget bill will remove that oversight. Terrible. Premier, will you reverse your decision and remove any reference to Hydro One from your budget bill? Minister. Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is transforming from a Crown Corporation to a TSX public company, Mr. Speaker. That will require changes, Mr. Speaker. Member from Dufferin, the legislation, Mr. Speaker, includes a provision that requires Hydro One to establish an ombudsman, an embedded ombudsman. And Mr. Speaker, what we have done is we have engaged, and he is engaged at this time, the former Auditor General of Canada, Denny Deshotel, to oversee the embedding of that ombudsman in Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, to ensure and assure the public uh, and the members of this House that. That, uh, the ombudsman will be accountable and will be transparent and will be meaningful going Member forward. From Mr. Hamilton Speaker. East Stony Creek. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Maybe she'd like to answer this. Ontarians don't trust your government and they don't trust your energy minister. Without the investigations of the officers of the legislature, none of this waste, abuse, and deceit would have ever seen the light of day. 
The public has no confidence that Hydro One can govern itself in the best interest of the ratepayers of this province without the oversight and the accountability of the, that these legislative officers bring to bear. Premier, you need to seriously reconsider your plan to privatize Hydro One. Why won't you? Why won't you remove any reference to Hydro One from your budget bill? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, second time. Minister. Speaker, uh, the members know that uh, in last year's budget, 2014, uh, we indicated we are going to study all of our enterprise assets to repurpose them, Mr. Speaker, for infrastructure purposes. What we're doing now, Mr. Speaker, is taking uh, uh, 50 percent of the proceeds of sale, putting it on debt, approximately 50 percent to invest in infrastructure. This morning, Mr. Speaker, the Premier was in Hamilton announcing a billion dollars of infrastructure for an LRT project, Mr. Speaker. That, that, Mr. Speaker, is going to come from proceeds of sale, Mr. Speaker, which are not coming from increased taxes, which are not com cutting, coming from cutting uh, services, Mr. Speaker, nor are they coming from new debt, Mr. Speaker. It's a responsible way to Mr. move forward, Mr. Yes, Mr. Speaker. And this morning, this morning, Mr. Speaker, the members of Invest Ottawa asked for more infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It's a priority everywhere in this province. Slowly catching up, I wanted to make sure the member heard me. I said, come to order, and the member from Nipissing, come to order. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Negotiations with high school teachers began months ago, and for months, the Minister of Education has been sitting on the sidelines, Speaker. She's watched as talk stalled, and instead of doing anything, she was perplexed and confused. On Thursday, we expect the Premier to legislate teachers back to work, but she's still going to have the same minister, Speaker, who failed to bring people together, the same minister who failed to get a deal, the same minister who failed to get our kids back into the classrooms. Will the Premier fire her minister and show that she's serious about getting a deal and ending the chaos in our education system? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I know that the leader of the third party understands the collective bargaining process. I know she understands that it would be impossible for her to know exactly what the minister has been doing. The minister has been working extremely hard, Mr. Speaker, to keep everyone at the table, to keep the issues moving, Mr. Speaker, and to try to get a deal. And that's as it should be, because that's where the deal has to be found, Mr. Speaker, is at the table. The point we're at right now, Mr. Speaker, is that the Education Relations Commission, which has been in place for many decades, Mr. Speaker, has ruled on jeopardy of the year for the students who have been out of school, Mr. Speaker. What is surprising to me, Mr. Speaker, is that the leader of the third party doesn't understand that the interest of the students is at stake, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, right now. Right. We have been part of a collective bargaining process. Close. That process will... Wrap up sentence, please. That collective bargaining process will continue, Mr. Speaker, but we must get the students back into school. I would have thought that the NDP would have wanted that, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> speaker, on Thursday. Please, please. You say it, please. I'm not sure that anyone wants to take that chance when I'm standing. Supplementary, please. On Thursday, we expect the Premier to legislate teachers back to work, Speaker, but the problems will not go away. The minister has blamed teachers. She's blamed boards of education. Stop the clock. Member from Trinity Spadina, Minister of Economic Development, come to order. Please finish. 
She's blamed the teachers, she's blamed boards of education, and these days, Speaker, she's blaming the opposition. The truth is that for months, this minister has watched from the sidelines minister and passed the buck. She was given a job, get a deal. She hasn't done that, Speaker. If the minister can't get the job done, then it's time for a new minister. So, will the cream? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. And I just might jump to warnings. This is insulting. Please finish. If the minister can't get the job done, it's time for a new minister. Will this premier do the right thing, fire her minister of education, and appoint someone who can actually do the job? You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, the students who have been out for a number of weeks could be back in school today had, uh, had the NDP worked with us. Mr. Speaker, I know that this is a difficult round of collective bargaining. I understand that. And I understand that the collective bargaining process has to go on and that the deal is going to be found at the table. And I understand that it's going to take, it's obviously going to take a bit more time, Mr. Member Speaker. That Essex. doesn't mean there's nothing been happening. There has been. It's going to take a bit more time. But in the interim, Mr. Speaker, what's important is that we get the kids back into the classroom. Right. That collective bargaining process can go on. But, you know, the, the, uh, the leader of the third party really in the past has, uh, has been part of, a, of a, a party that has supported getting workers back to work, Mr. Speaker. Howard Hampton stated in 2002, the government has done a That's wise it. thing here. Four days of debate, five days of, of debate, six days of debate would not have left anyone in a winning position. Thank they you. voted to end the garbage strike, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The solution to the chaos in the education sector is to actually bring people together. So far, this minister has only been pushing people away. She's perplexed, Speaker, by the issues. She blames everyone but herself. Her job was actually to get a deal, but she has failed at that spectacularly. And it's the students, the parents, the teachers, they're all paying the price. The Premier needs to show she's serious about a solution, Speaker. She needs to fire her Minister of Education and appoint a minister who can actually bring people together and get a deal done. Is the Premier ready to get serious, Speaker, or is she going to stand by her perplexed, confused and ineffective Minister, minister of Agriculture? You it, please? You see it, please? Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I don't actually think that personal attacks get us anywhere, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Right. I really believe that I really, I really believe that the people who I believe, I really believe that the people who are engaged in the collective bargaining process need to do their work. I, I that, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to need a bit more time. In the interim, Mr. Speaker, students in Oshawa and in uh, Bramalee and in Nickel Belt could be in school today, Mr. Speaker, if the NDP had supported our back to work legislation in the first instance, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is, the collective bargaining process is going to. Thank you. One sentence, Raph. Just to say, Mr. Speaker, that we want those kids back in school. We want the collective bargaining process to continue. New question, the leader of the third party. The truth hurts, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. The Premier likes to say that she respects municipalities, but the proof is in the pudding, Speaker. Northwest Ontario Municipal Association says that northern communities are going to be hit hard by the, the Premier's Hydro One sell-off. His president says, or their president says, there has been no consultation with these communities, which is, in our opinion, unfair. We believe that this decision to sell off Hydro One assets is merely short-term gain for long-term pain. End quote. Well, will the premier take Hydro One out of her Stephen Harper-style omnibus budget and get uh, an opportunity for groups like NOMA, the Northern Ontario Municipal Association, allow them to have their say, Speaker, in some kind of public process. It's the least they deserve. Thank you. you know, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting. Um, 
the very first time I had a, a really in-depth conversation about northern infrastructure, I was the Minister of Transportation. I was meeting with, uh, with mayors from northwestern Ontario, and I can remember the mayor of Kenora, Dave Canfield, said to me, you know, we need, we need a, a consistent investment in roads and bridges. I think there are 19 bridges in Kenora, Mr. Speaker, and he was asking for predictable infrastructure funding. That in 2010, Timmons, Mr. Speaker, when I was the Minister of uh, Transportation, that planted a seed that made it uh, clear to me that we needed to do something that would provide infrastructure funding over the long term. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. $130 billion over the next 10 years. We are making investments across this province, including in northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that communities, municipalities have what they need to thrive economically. It's not just NOMA, the Northern Ontario Municipal Association. Northern municipalities are speaking out as well because they do not want to have to pay the price for this premier selling off of Hydro One. In fact, the city of Kenora, Dave Canfield, uh, had a motion at his council, and they unanimously voted to send the premier a letter calling for her to pull the plug on selling Hydro One. <laughs> Supporting NOMA's resolution, oh. Councillor Paul Ryan said, and I quote, I think they're going ahead kind of recklessly here, unquote. Uh -huh. These municipalities deserve to have a safe speaker. Will the Premier take Hydro One out of her Stephen Harper-style omnibus bill and let the municipalities or Francis and Tamora have a hearing? You see the please? You see the please? Thank you. I, uh, not even in your seat. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I was in, uh, I had the, the pleasure to be in Hamilton this morning, Mr. Oh. Speaker. I just, I just want to talk about what we, were, uh, what we were talking about in Hamilton because it's directly related to this issue of having the funding to be able to invest in infrastructure. We were pleased to announce that we will provide a billion dollars for capital costs to build a new LRT in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. And it was received very, very well. So what this LRT will do, Mr. Speaker, it'll offer service from McMaster University through downtown Hamilton to Queenston Circle. It will ultimately extend to Eastgate Square. The question I would ask to the uh, leader of the third party is, which part of that project would she cancel, Mr. Speaker, right. if we did not have the funds to invest in infrastructure? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Speaker, it's not just Northwestern Ontario, the City of Hamilton, the City of Brantford, Prince Edward County, the City of Toronto, all are entertaining motions calling on this Premier to stop the sell-off of Hydro One, and more are coming. They know that she's playing a game of false choices here. The Premier says she respects municipalities, but respect means more than just lip service. It means actually listening to what people People have to say. Now, will the Premier take Hydro One out of her Stephen Harper style omnibus budget speaker and let Ontarians have a say? So, Mr. Speaker, I would, I would, ask, the, uh, I would ask the leader of the third party again. So, the LRT in uh, Hamilton, it will ultimately extend to Eastgate Square. It'll connect directly to the new West Harbour GO station, and that station will be ready in time for the. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Member from uh, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, second time. The station will be ready for the, the Pan Am Games. We're also going to extend the GO Rail from West Harbour Station to a, no go, a new GO Station at Centennial Parkway in Eastern Hamilton. So, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the leader of the third party, which part of those projects, or would she cancel the whole project, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. Would she just say that Hamilton doesn't need that connectivity? Hamilton doesn't need that connectivity to the rest of the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. Hamilton doesn't need that new LRT, Mr. And Speaker. Economy, Mr. Speaker, because if we don't have the funds, we can't make that investment, and that's exactly what the leader of the third party is suggesting. Mr. Thank you. New, new question. 
The member from Dufferin Calvary. My question is to the Attorney General, Speaker. Saria Gangram was killed and stabbed when she was stabbed by her former boyfriend, Lasalas Allen. He was out on bail, released with the condition that he could have no contact with her. Clearly, Lasalas Allen did not follow his bail conditions, and it led to the tragic death of Saria Gangram, leaving three children without their mom. This tragedy could have been prevented had someone tracked Allen while he was on bail to ensure he was complying with his conditions. Minister, why aren't you tracking those who are out on bail and whether they are complying with their bail conditions? Thank you. Thank you. First of all, Mr. Speaker, when I hear you know, such a, an unfortunate uh, incident, uh, you know, my heart goes to, to the family. And uh, Domestic violence is a problem, in, not just in Ontario, but it's a, it's a real problem that we try to address as government. And in my previous position as the Minister of Community and Safety, you know, we did a lot of work because the majority of those in our correctional institution are uh, there, uh, a lot of them, for domestic violence. So there is a lot of, of work that is being done. So the bail, the bail system in Ontario is, uh, is uh, a program that has been in place for, for a long time. So to say that uh, you know someone is out on bail and nobody is following what they're doing, Answer. that's incorrect. Because you know the police officer do uh, know who are out on bail and they do follow uh, what they are uh, doing. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, the victims aren't looking for sympathy; they're looking for action. Victims must have confidence that when. Judges set bail conditions. There is a process in place to ensure they will not be re-victimized. Clearly, your ministry has failed to do this. Christopher Husbands was under house arrest when he shot a child in the Eaton Centre. Lasalas Allen's bail condition included no contact with Saria Gangam when he went to her home and killed her. I will ask you again, for the victims who need to know they will be protected if they report a crime, for the families trying to protect their children from further victimization, for the public who expect bail conditions to be respected and offenders pun pun punished when they are ignored, when will you start tracking offenders released from jail to ensure they comply with their bail conditions? So again, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, like this is a, a tragic incident. You know, like I cannot uh, uh, believe, you know, how a family who is faced with uh, such a tragic incident. And I'll say that my ministry and the Ministry of Community and Social Services, the uh, the Women's Directorate, we work together and we do everything to make sure that this does not happen. Yeah. And again, I'll say that the, when you know. The, these uh, people, when they are out on bail, there is a follow-up done by the police. Uh, the, by the police, and when uh, you know someone is uh, is found to have violated their bail condition, you know they are uh, back into the uh, jail. So, uh, again, uh, I, uh, I my my heart goes to to the family. And uh, in my ministry and in this government, we'll do everything we Thank can you. to prevent this to happen. Thank you. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, our schools have been thrown into chaos due to more than a decade of chronic underfunding of education in the province. Instead of ensuring that all students with special needs have the services they need, the Premier and her government have cut $6 million from Toronto schools. Instead of fixing the systemic problem of underfunding, this government chose to cut $250 million over 2014-2015. Speaker, page 230 of their budget outlines it. Then the Premier and her minister say they are perplexed about, what is, about the ongoing unrest in the education sector. The Liberal government made this mess, minister and instead of fixing resources. the problem, they are, again, recall Bill 115, choosing to legislate instead of negotiate. Huh. Premier, will you recognize the failure of, failure of your Minister of Education to get a deal Question. with teachers and fire her immediately? Yeah. Education. education. Yes, thank you. And I, I really think what we all need to focus on today 
is the fact that we have heard from the Education Relations Commission that the school year is in jeopardy for 72,000 children, for 72,000 students. And what we really need to focus on is how do we get those kids back in the classroom and get them there right away. Now, if we'd had the cooperation of the NDP yesterday, we could have had those kids back in the schools today. Every day we don't get cooperation on speedy passage of the bill is another day that students are out of school. And this whole, uh, I remember a day in 2008 where there was a TTC strike. Answer. And uh, the NDP and the Conservatives and the Liberals all and work together to pass back Member to Kitchener, legislation in one day. We could do that for the 72,000 students that are, out of, that are out of class. We could do that, Answer. but we need to work together. My priority now is to get the kids back in class. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. What the minister should be focusing on is actually trying to negotiate a deal, not legislate. Speaker, the Premier and her minister have had months to get a deal with teachers that would put students first. And this doesn't mean to keep class sizes manageable. And it doesn't mean a further reduction of services in the classroom. Students and families should not be shouldering the brunt of the cost of Liberal scandals. Speaker, it's obvious that the minister has failed students and families by not really trying to get a deal with teachers. Speaker, will the premier force her minister to take responsibility for making students pay the price of her failings by firing her immediately? Minister. Yes, thank you. And uh, actually, there are negotiations going on this week. So negotiations do continue because we believe we should get a negotiated settlement. But sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes there's a strike. And I think the, the, the party opposite needs to remember that when they were the government, they actually asked the ERC for advice three times. Three times the ERC gave jeopardy rulings when they were government. In the first case, in the first case, the parties agreed voluntarily to go back to work and to uh, has, uh, have binding arbitration, which is actually what's in the bill. But in the other two cases, the parties didn't agree to go back to work when there was a jeopardy ruling, and the NDP government tabled back Answer. to work legislation, and everybody in the House Thank came you. together to pass it. Thank you. New question. The member from York Western. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Since the global downturn, Ontario's economy has not only recovered but is projected to lead the country in economic growth. Since uh, the recession, Ontario has created more than 500,000 jobs. To be exact, 510,200 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Nearly 98% of the recovered jobs since the recession are full-time positions and 73% in above-wages industries. In fact, our job recovery rate since the recession is 187% while outpacing the United States at 134 per cent. However, Mr. Speaker, youth unemployment rate remains too high, and our government recognizes that. Question. Through you to the minister, could you please explain to this House what is being done to tackle youth unemployment? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And while Ontario's economy remains poised to lead the country in growth this year and probably next year as well, the fact is youth unemployment remains far too high. And that's why in 2013 we announced the Youth Job Strategy that's investing $295 million over two years to help 30,000 young people from across the province gain necessary job experience. Since the fall of 2013, 
More than 26,000 young people have seen opportunities and work experience that they've been able to obtain through this program. However, Mr. Speaker, there's still more work to do, and that's why in this year's budget we're renewing the youth job strategy by providing an additional $250 million. This will bring our total investment in youth employment programming to more than $565 million. Answer. Mr. Speaker, through these investments, we're helping the, our province's youth succeed and get good job experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for that answer. I appreciate being part of a government that is making smart, strategic investments to tackle the province's youth unemployment rate. In fact, Mr. Speaker, last week I announced how our government's investments are benefiting some of the youth in my riding of York Southwestern through the Youth Connection Skills Program. $125,000 are being invested so that youth from the Western Mount Dennis area will be able to gain relevant job experience. These young constituents will gain critical Member from Brentford, a second time. that would allow them to transition into Ontario's job market. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the youth skills connection is helping youth across the province to gain the experience they need to succeed? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the work she's doing in her own community when it comes to some of these youth employment programs and, and working with some of her local uh, groups to ensure that her young people in her community get access to these very important programs. And the Youth Skills Connections pro uh, program promotes partnerships among business, labour, educators, not-for-profits and youth to identify and solve skills development issues. In the first intake, the Youth Skills Connections uh, program invested more than $13 million to support 51 programs across the country. 3,400 young people have already received employment training through this program. Currently, the province is investing over $11 million to launch the second intake of the Youth Skills Connections. The second intake will involve 45 programs uh, that will be selected to help young people get the skills yes, sir. they need to succeed. Mr. Speaker, rather than heckling on, on our efforts to, uh, to provide youth uh, employment opportunities, the opposition Thank should you. be supporting our budget. Def Thank you. New question to the Member from Bristol, Yellow Town. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Minister, as a result of 12 years of mismanagement and waste by your government, people are suffering. Special education is in need of adequate levels of investment. Vulnerable children are in need of educational assistance so they have proper support to learn and achieve success in the classroom. This is why no parent and no student in Blue Water District School Board can accept that you are sitting on your hands as 50 ed special Leader, education Secretary. EAs are removed from the classroom. Wow. Making vulnerable kids pay for the price for your mismanagement waste is wrong, and frankly, it's unconscionable. Minister, I ask you, how do you justify cutting 50 educational assistants at Blue Water District School Board under your watch as Minister of Education when the number of needy children has not decreased? Oh, it's increased. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and, and obviously, special education is very important to us. Uh, it might interest the minister or the, the member opposite to know that uh, when I was a trustee, I served for years on my board's special education advisory committee. So this is actually an area that I feel quite strongly about: is, is special education. And because we feel very strongly about it, uh, but both my predecessors or the Premier and myself, our special education funding has actually gone up over $1.1 billion by 68 per cent oh, since 2002-03. So uh, we're actually spending $2.72 billion on special education. That's not Answer. a reduced number. It's actually uh, the, the, uh, the special education funding remains steady, Thank just you. like all the other areas of the funding model. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister of Education. Here's the truth. Kathy Cotter's seven-year-old daughter is bearing the brunt of your cuts. She has retinal dystrophy and is legally blind. With her EA gone, there will be no one to braille her books. Candace Huber's eight-year-old son has type 1 diabetes and hypoglycemic episodes. With his EA gone, there will be no one to watch and help keep him safe. Kathy, Candace, and many other parents with children with learning, mental, physical, and a myriad of health issues have lost faith in you, your Premier, and your government. 
You're sitting on your hands while blind, autistic, and diabetic students are losing the critical school support they need. These students are frustrated, their parents are stressed out, and your only answer to them is not true. Minister, how can you put the Liberal Party's political fortunes ahead of Ontario's vulnerable children? Good question. Minister. And, and I, it, as, I, as I said before, the, fo the fortunes of our special needs children are very important to us. In fact, one of the things that we've been doing through the recent labour disruptions is making sure that the most vulnerable children still continue to receive community services. Uh, but the, to go directly to your question. One of the things that, that has, has happened in Blue Water, in, in the uh, board that is in your area, is that the number of children in Blue Water has dramatically increased, despite the fact that the enrollment has gone down over the ta last 10 years, the funding has actually gone up by 40 per cent. So answer. think about this. The funding has gone up 40 per cent. The number of children in Blue Water has gone down. So the amount of special needs funding in Blue Water. Thank you. New questions. A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The government insists that the Ontario Energy Board will protect Ontarians from higher hydro rates when the Premier sells off Hydro One. It doesn't make any sense. And now the government is stacking the OEB with people from the energy sector. The government just appointed Paul Pasterick, a former senior VP of ACON, to the Ontario Energy Board. ACON shares the mega contract to refurbish the Darlington nuclear plant with SNC-Lavalin. The Premier is putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Is the Premier ready to admit that the OEB isn't going to stand up to a privatized Hydro One. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board and all of the uh, Crown corporations and agencies have very strict conflict of interest uh, regulations, Mr. Speaker. Uh, without, without, those, uh, without those provisions there, Mr. Speaker, there are a tremendous uh, number of people out there with experience who can contribute, Mr. Speaker, and uh, because they are engaged in the community or engaged in the economy, Mr. Mr. Speaker, should not disentitle them to serve, Mr. Speaker. There are people in this room, Mr. Speaker, who declare interest, Mr. Speaker, on particular issues that come before this House. It's part of doing business. It's part of government. And Mr. Speaker, the appointments are tremendous appointments, and we recognize the quality and experience of those people. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. The government also named Victoria Christie to the OEB. She spent 10 years as an electricity industry lobbyist. They've appointed Susan Frank, who spent her career lobbying for higher rates on behalf of Hydro One. The OEB is being turned into a rubber stamp for industry. It's called regulatory capture. It means the regulator gets filled with industry people who are more interested in the industry than in the rate payers. And it means that if the Premier sells off Hydro One, the OEB won't even be a speed bump in the way of higher rates. Is the Premier ready to admit that selling Hydro One is going to mean higher hydro bills and that this new OEB won't do anything to stop that? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know there's a lot of high drama in the, in the question that's been asked. The answer is quite simple, Mr. Speaker. The board has conflict of interest guidelines that the appointees would be required to adhere to. And I repeat everything I said in my question, Mr. Speaker. Regarding the oversight, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board is an independent regulator with a mandate to protect the interests of Ontario ratepayers. Mr. Speaker, they have reviewed applications. For example, in 2010, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for distribution, received a 9% reduction 
Ford's capital request. Member Mr. from Essex, second time. In 2012, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for transmission, received a 3 percent reduction. reduction. Ford's capital request. Mr. Speaker, the chair, the uh, CEO of the Ontario Energy Board was before committee last week. She made a strong case for its independence Answer. and for the tremendous improvements legislation that will be forthcoming, Mr. Speaker, to protect the ratepayers in Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, we're all affected by regulations every day. Whether it's a farmer applying for a municipal water access or a renovation permit for a local downtown store, every industry is governed in part by regulations. Ontario's stringent and internationally respected regulatory systems result in standards that are world-class and products that are recognized as safe, effective and top quality. Number At one. the same time, the agri-food sector faces regulatory-related challenges to the timely introduction of new food products, oh. processes and technologies that keep pace with scientific advancements and the global business environment. My constituents and people across Ontario recognize the need to develop a Question. robust regulatory environment. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House on what our government is doing going to do to eliminate excessive Thank regulations you. that make running agri-food business. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Thank Mr. Speaker. Very and I want to thank the member for Barry for that question this morning. She's a great champion of agriculture in the Barry area. Certainly As is. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, I committed to building a business climate that encourages the next generation to pursue opportunities in the agri-food sector that allows producers to earn a living, raise a family, and indeed contribute to Ontario's economy. Just recently, I hosted an Open for Business Forum with leaders of Ontario's agriculture organizations representing the entire value chain. This was the eighth forum hosted by my ministry and the second since I was named Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Open for Business forums are an excellent opportunity to learn what is working for the industry, where we can collaborate in areas that may need improvement. Since 2008, Mr. Speaker, an important statistic, Ontario has eliminated 17 per cent of all the regulatory requirements, wow. over 80,000 regulatory burdens, but we also know there's yes, more sir. to do. So by working together, we will reduce the regulatory burden thank for you. agriculture in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answer. It's great to hear that progress is being made by working together with the agri-food sector. Reducing red, red tape for farmers and the egg food sector creates a more competitive environment for businesses while supporting Ontario farm families, and that's good for business. I know that by bringing together multiple ministries and a wide range of agriculture industry leaders, we can create significant opportunities for improving the productivity and economic impact of our agri-food sector. That's why, as a government, we must continue advocating for our family farmers to ensure that policy, policy is sensitive to their needs. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update this House on some of the tangible policy outcomes that have been achieved tangible. through open Question. business so Good. far? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Barrie for a supplementary. I know uh, she's a regular visitor to farmers markets in the Barrie area, uh, acquiring that local great food that's grown in Ontario. In a short time, uh, we've achieved several successes because we work, we've done together, including providing greenhouse operators with more options to deal effectively with wastewater, streamlining approvals for the on-farm and aerobic digester operators, meet regulation amendments that create a more flexible approach to compliance, clarifying regulatory requirements, and promoting competitiveness and innovation for industry without compromising food safety. We made changes to the tax classification for grain elevators that is estimated to have saved elevator orders $3 million based on projected 2016 tax rates. And again, Mr. Speaker, at the request of the industry, we delink the requirement to roll an agri stability and to participate in Ontario's risk management program, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, on the Friday before the Victoria Day long weekend, your government announced the cancellation of an extremely successful program that assists and uh, creates jobs in new businesses in Ontario. The self-employment benefit has existed for 23 years and has outstanding results in Prince Edward and Hastings counties and across the province. Over 400 new businesses have been created in Prince Edward and Hastings counties in the, fast, in the last five years 
as a result of this program. Premier, can you explain why your government would kill one of the only tools that it has in its disposal to create jobs in rural Ontario? I want to hear this. <laughs> Those for training colleges and university. For training colleges and universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's workforce is our greatest asset. As Premier keeps saying that you know our people are our greatest assets. That's why we have been investing heavily in our people in, in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Ontario invests $1.2 billion annually in employment Ontario, various programs through that program. We serve 1 million Ontarians every year, Mr. Speaker, just to make sure that uh, they get the right training so that they can find jobs, they can contribute to our economy. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to investing in a range of programs, high-quality programs through Employment Ontario services to uh, various people across our province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, in order to deliver the best quality, the highest quality training programs, we wanted to streamline the uh, Ontario uh, Ontario self-employment benefit. That's Answer. what we have been working on it to make sure that uh, Ontarians get they get the best quality service from the government. Great Thank you. Answer. I'm not sure I got an answer there, Mr. Speaker. I can uh, smell a late show coming. Uh, Premier, in the last five years, the OSEB has created 424 businesses in my riding alone. Wow. Hundreds more in Northumberland County. Hundreds more in Barrie, right across the province. In my area, there's a completion rate alone of 90 per cent. This is a program that was working. Local economic development officials uh, tell me that roughly 70 per cent of the businesses stay in business well after completing this program. As hydro rates and new payroll taxes place additional burdens on small businesses, you're making it harder to even become self-employed in Ontario. Premier, why are you killing a program that's clearly an economic success when it's used well, instead of reforming it so that self-employed people Question. across Ontario can have the same success that people in my riding have had? Why are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater with this program? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to ensure that Ontario's tax dollars are spent in a more responsible way. The reality is that, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the, uh, the program, the Ontario Self-Employment Benefit Program, is a very costly program, and only half of the clients they get uh, they complete the program. So that's why we are diverting part of the funding from that program to the Ministry of Economic Development and Infrastructure, so that. Uh, so that they can invest more on uh, small business enterprise centres. We have 57 small enterprise uh, centres across the province of Ontario. Through these centres, Mr. Speaker, the small businesses they receive the best advice in order to uh, improve their uh, their businesses. Mr. Speaker, the winding down of this program is the right and the responsible way to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the, the Premier. This morning we learned two things. First, we learned that uh, at long last the government actually knows how to spell LRT when it comes to Hamilton. But we also learned that neighbourhoods near Eastgate Square have been shut out of the government's LRT plans. Please finish. Neighbourhoods around Eastgate Square have been cut out of the government's plans. These are the same areas that would have benefited greatly from the economic uplift that the LRT would bring. But instead of connecting to these neighbourhoods, the LRT will connect to a traffic circle. Why did the government break its promise to connect the LRT in Hamilton to Eastgate Square? So, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Transportation is going to want to come in in the supplementary, but I just want to draw attention to, the, the, to what's happening right now. In the early part of question period, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party had nothing to say about funding transit, Mr. Speaker, only wanted to undermine the plan that we have in order to put funding into transit, Mr. Speaker. And now what she wants to do is she wants, to, she wants more, Mr. Speaker. She wants to fund more transit, Mr. Speaker. She now has a question about the the, the efficacy, the particular route, the uh, the investment that's going to be made in uh, in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. So, what I would say to the leader of the third party is, you can't have it both ways. You've either got to have a way to fund transit, or you can't fund it, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. We're putting that plan in place, and because of that, Mr. Speaker, Hamilton is getting an LRT. 
seated, please. Be seated, please. I uh, start the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's really too bad that this generation of Ontarians and all generations going forward have a Premier, the only Premier in the history of Ontario, who hasn't figured out how to keep hydro public and build infrastructure at the same time. This LRT isn't even being constructed until 2019, even though it was promised back in 2007. And yet, back then, this Premier was the Minister of Transportation, and she took $4 billion out of transit funding. Speaker. Minister of Education. That shortened all kinds of projects. Some were cancelled. Minister of Education will come to order. Minister of Energy, come to order second time. Please finish. These cuts, other LRT projects, as I mentioned in the GTHA, were either cancelled, deferred, shortened, or had their funding cut. So, what guarantee can this premier offer Hamiltonians that this now very shortened and delayed LRT line will actually begin construction four long years from now? Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I was delighted to join with the Premier and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing earlier today and the leader of that party's own hometown, Speaker, to announce the landmark historic commitment that our government has made to build an LRT for that community. Up Member from Essex is warned. Carry on. The province will cover 100 per cent of the capital costs of building this LRT in Hamilton, Speaker, which will help grow the economy, reduce travel times, connect people. And, Speaker, this LRT will offer speedy service from McMaster University through downtown Hamilton to Queenston Circle and will connect directly to the new West Harbour GO station that this government is currently building, which will be open in time for the Pan Am Parapan game, Speaker. The LRT, Speaker, will ultimately extend to Eastgate Square. Thank you. Speaker, this is a clear. Thank you. And the Minister of Transportation has learned, when I stand, you sit, and if it happens again, you'll be named. New question. The member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, I've heard you say many times here in the Legislature that you are committed to the transformation of corrections in our province. But there remain problems at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, such as capacity issues, violence and contraband. In this environment, it could be difficult to rehabilitate inmates and to reduce rates of reoffending. Ontarians need to see concrete action from you to tackle these very important challenges. Recently, you announced the construction of a regional intermittent centre at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, and this is designed to house intermittent offenders. And this is very important and a step in your goal to building safer communities in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, could the minister Question. please explain to this House how the construction of a regional intermittent centre is going to address the problems that I've mentioned thank you. here? Mr. Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Kitchener Centre for asking a very important uh, uh, question, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, our top priority is the safety and security of all our correctional staff and inmates at our facilities. Recently, we began construction on a 112-bed regional intermittent center on the grounds of the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center in London, Ontario. This new center, Speaker, builds on the success of the Toronto Intermittent Center and is the next step in our strategy for intermittent offenders. These are inmates, Speaker, who are serving 90-day sentences, typically on weekends. Housing intermittent offenders in their own facility will help to alleviate many of the concerns that we are seeing at EMDC. For example, it's an efficient and dedicated way to address capacity pressure by increasing the number of available beds, cutting down on overcrowding, Answer. and reducing violence. 
It also means, Speaker, that inmates at EMDC will no longer need to be regularly moved around to accommodate uh, uh, the influx of those serving you. weekend sentences. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services for that answer. I know that Ontarians, and specifically those who are in southern Ontario, are going to be very happy to hear about this new facility being built at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre as part of a larger strategy for intermittent offenders. But, Mr. Speaker, when we hear about the issues at the EMDC, it's hard to believe that just building a new facility is the answer. The minister talks about a transformation of corrections and his pledge to build stronger and safer communities, but I'd like to hear more about how this new centre is going to serve the people of Southern Ontario and the role that it's going to play in the transformation of corrections. So, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please speak further Question. on how the new regional intermittent centre is going to help ease tensions and transform corrections to build stronger and safer communities in Ontario? Sure. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, Speaker, I also want to note that uh, uh, building a separate facility uh, will also prevent contraband from being introduced into the main facility by intermittent offenders that return to their communities during the week, and that's an important step, Speaker, to keep our detention centre safe and, in particularly, our, our correctional uh, staff and other inmates. Speaker, the member from Kitchener Centre is absolutely right. Simply building a new facility will not fix the correctional system in Ontario, and this alone cannot build strong and safer communities. But right now, Speaker, we are seeing a revolving door in the correctional system. That is why it is important that we keep, we take steps uh, to rehabilitate and reintegrate those in our system so we can stop the cycle of uh, reoffense. Part of that, Speaker, is aided by separating low-risk offenders from more serious offenders, which Answer. is exactly what centres like this one will do. Speaker, we firmly believe that this new centre will help, the, help to alleviate pressures and Thank issues you. at EMDC and have made reputation of Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Niagara West Lambert. Question, Speaker, the Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, Minister, Landing's turtle is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Where it exists in Ontario lives in shallow waterways and wetlands, including the Niagara Peninsula. They are uniquely vulnerable to extinction because it takes 20 years before females start to reproduce. The Ontario courts made a decision recently. They set a precedent. When choosing between industrial wind turbines and a threatened species, Blanding's turtle, they sided with the turtle, tossing out a wind farm application. It was the right decision. It was the right thing to do. My question simply is, if it's right in Prince Edward County, shouldn't we protect the Blanding's turtle environment everywhere in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Proceed it, please. Proceed it, please. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, I want to I want to thank the member uh, for the question. Before he concluded, I was gathering my thoughts as well, and yes. the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, who I know would love to weigh in on this as well, was having a similar thought and lobbed it over to me that he found that I think, as I did, very interesting that the the party, uh, the official opposition, is asking a question in this regard. The the member posed the question. He seems to be supportive of what has happened in this case. Uh, I would assume in the supplementary he's going to come forward with some information that suggests in another instance the Blanding turtle did not carry the day. I would assume that's the point of the question here that's coming forward. I'll look forward to hearing exactly what he has to say. I'm happy to hear that in this position or in, in the first question he was happy that the Endangered Species Act that we brought into place actually did have an effect to protect an endangered species. I'm happy to hear that you're pleased with the legislation, yes, although I don't think it's legislation that you supported when it was originally introduced into the House. Thank you. I thank the minister for anticipating my question. I just would hope they get a single answer from the minister on how he's going to protect the threatened species in the province. Now, so you, 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 got it, you got it exactly right. The courts have determined in the decision between steel turbines, 500 meters tall, cemented in 40 truckloads of concrete in a wetland, to lose out to a threatened species in the Blanding's turtle. I agree with that decision. I'm sure you agree with that decision as well. My point, Minister, is why was it that it was the courts who had to force your hand? Where were you? You're the minister. You need to know your role 
and play it. You have the lead on the Endangered Species Act in the province of Ontario. So instead of waiting for the courts to intervene in the Niagara Peninsula, will you do the right thing? Your choice between the turtle or more steel. What should be Thank in the you. wetlands, the endangered species or turtle? <laughs> Minister. Speaker, Speaker, with the legislation in place, there is a committee called CASERA. The committee on the Never too late. Finish, please. Speaker, under the legislation that I don't think the official opposition supported, and they seem to be loving now. CASERO is, stands for the Committee on the Status of Species at Risk in Ontario. They make a decision on when a species is listed. Once it's listed, it receives protection, and the habitat for the species also receives protection. Through that pro <laughs> Bill has been listed for years. Member from Niagara West, I'm standing. I'm standing. You should know that. <laughs> Finish, please. Speaker, through that process, once the species is listed and the habitat is protected and a project is overlaid on Answer. that particular species and its habitat, there is a process in place called overall benefit where if the contractor or the proponent can come forward Thank and you. provide a way to accommodate the species. Thank you. The uh, Minister of Children and Youth Services on a point of order. Thank you. Uh, late introduction, Speaker, if I may. I notice my very good friend and mentor Mark Holland is here from Heart and Stroke, and uh, he's been my EDA chair for two elections, and he is a federal Liberal candidate in Ajax. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. From on the point of order. Just a quick introduction. Also, uh, Michael Purley from the Canadian Cancer Society, as well as uh, all of the other uh, ladies, Joanne Dinardos from the Cancer Society. Here, they have been uh, uh, pushing for a ban on flavored tobacco for a very long time. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading for Bill 57, an act to create a framework for pooled registered pension plans and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. Oh, wait. On May 25th, Mr. Sousa moved third reading of Bill 57. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Nagby. Mr. Nagby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmel. Ms. Darmel. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madam Lalonde. Madam Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Bernil. Ms. Bernil. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller, Mr. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. De Novo. Mr. De Novo. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. The ayes being 80 and the nays being 19, I declare the motion carried. Be a result that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 45. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
On May 13th, Ms. Darmala moved third reading of Bill 45, an act to enhance public health by enacting the health, a Healthy Menu Choices Act 2014 and the Electronic Cigarette Act 2014, and by amending the Smoke Free Ontario Act. Mr. Baker has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Baker's motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Naffy. Mr. Naffy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Lee. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balk. Mr. Balkus. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Ms. Jasper. Ms. Jasper. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Dommerle. Ms. Dommerle. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madam Lalonde. Madam Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Gurneal. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mrs. McLeod. Mrs. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Ure. Mr. Ure. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Van. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 56, the nays are 44. The ayes being 56 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. Ms. Darmala has moved third reading of Bill 45, an act to enhance public health by enacting the Healthy Menu uh, Choices Act 2014 and the Electronic Cigarettes Act 2014 and by amending the Smoke Free Ontario Act. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? No. no. I heard a no. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Ms. Darmala has moved third reading of Bill 45. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Darmala. Ms. Darmala. Mr. Nappi. Mr. Nappi. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. 
Cicerelli. Mr. Cicerelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardnett. Mr. Bardnett. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Cardi. Mr. Cardi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Lee. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Balkus. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassick. Ms. Jassick. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madam Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milcher. Mr. Milcher. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mrs. McLeod. Mrs. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Yakubas. Mr. Yakubas. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Jo Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. The ayes are 99, the nays are 1. The ayes being 99 and the nays being 1, I declare the motion carried. We have resolved that the bill be now passed and entitled as in the motion. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.